Now, we've got Phil Nelson. Now, I had him on previously, and he's going to have to help me, Phil, you will, because I don't have a computer. I couldn't do uh, the notes from your new, a new book. So the last book was uh, LBJ, The Mastermind of the L uh, JFK Assassination. Uh, Phil, what's the name of your new book? Okay, the new book. Uh, c can you hear me okay? Yeah, just okay. fine. Okay, good. Um, the new book's title is LBJ, From Mastermind to the Colossus. And that term, the Colossus, is explained in, within the book. Basically, it comes from Bill Moyers, of all people, who used that term to describe uh, Johnson uh, in a review he did of uh, Mark Updegrove's book. Mark Updegrove is the uh, the head guy at the LBJ library, and he wrote a book, of course, lauding everything that Johnson ever did, uh, and um, for for that, Bill Moyers uh, agreed that he was just a wonderful guy and never, you know, never did anything that was uh, untoward or illegal or unconstitutional or whatever. Really, no. I could agree with that. So let's get this over with quickly. Tell people how to get the book right now, and we won't do it for a whole while. Okay. Well, it's available, of course, at Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and, and um, many bookstores. I can't say it's in every bookstore, of course, but and I can't keep tabs on that, but bas basically the online uh, outlets do have it. Books a Million is another, of course, you know, the, the normal, the, the normal bookstores. And larger bookstores uh, the, of the bricks and mortar kind, like uh, Barnes and Noble stores, generally have it. All right. In short, your name is Phil Nelson. Let's get on with the interview. Now, I'm starting with a point that's contentious. Then we'll go downhill. But I, I got to start with this. You're saying that um, the the death of James Forrestal in 1949 which was ruled a suicide, but you, oh, I don't like this. Here's your quote. It was, in fact, a murder done by a cabal of Zionists who weren't happy that Forrest all had fought against the U.N. actions forming Israel. Now, all I can say to that is if you don't have names, I'm, I'm going to immediately say you're guessing. Go to it. Well, I'm not guessing at all. I... Uh basically relied on, I think, arguably the most intensive uh, investigation uh, that has ever been done. And it was written by a, um, a, a man, uh, Dr. Uh, David Martin, who also goes by DC Dave uh, on the internet. And he does a blog uh, on the internet. And basically he has a six part very detailed examination of everything about the death of James Forrestal. In fact, that's the title of his uh, his work. Uh, I, I believe it's uh, "Who Who Killed James Forrestal." Uh, he he has looked at it in exquisite detail, and all I've done is basically referenced uh, his work and also some some other books of that were done by uh, one was a joint effort by Townsend Hoops and uh, Douglas Brinkley, the historian. Uh, both of them, you know, very knowledgeable and very uh, accomplished men. They, and I've borrowed a little bit from them and a little bit from David Martin and so forth and compiled this material based upon that. It's not speculation so much as uh, it's, it's looking at all of the facts and trying to... Uh, interpret those facts and and establish you know what might have uh happened there when uh james forrestal died by either jumping or being uh thrown out of a uh, 16th floor window at the well, uh i would was thrown out i'm sorry i would guess you're going with thrown out Yes, I, I am, because uh, the, okay. the fact of the matter is he had been uh, committed there 
uh, you know, against his will some weeks before, and it all was the result of uh, a lot of uh, uh, history in, in, in 19, it was, this happened in 1949, of course, and basically there, there was uh, a lot being done to uh, get him out of his position as the Secretary of Defense, uh, and it was it was a, a concerted effort by a number of people, including some journalists at the time, Walter Winchell, and Drew Pearson. Wait, wait. You're saying Walter uh, Winchell reported or was involved in it? No, I'm. I'm well, I'm, I'm saying that yes, that he and and Drew Pearson were both involved in in uh, in a verbal assault, which is arguably arguably it was uh, libelous. What what they were doing? It, it's all in the book. Uh, you know, I, do, if you want me to start quoting from it, I'd be glad to do that. But it's all there. The quote: Look, when you say a cabal of Zionists, Zionism was not a cabal. There were good guys. And they were at war with the labor Zionists in Israel. These were what's known as the Irgun or the Chayrut. And there were the Aguja, the religious Zionists, who were fighting with the labor Zionists. It's a very complicated situation. When you use the word Zionist by itself, it's painting a, a very false picture. Well, I, I tried to to not use the word by itself. I was trying to portray the most militant Zionists, the the ones who were exactly. the most aggressive. Uh, in Did I lose you? No, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought you had the floor there. Militants were the ones who founded the state, and it's, uh, look, those painted as militant uh, the Irgun or the Khairut were not the ones who killed James Forrestal. They were fighting for the li their lives in Israel. Yes, I, I understand all that. I, I went into some depth to uh, explain the different degrees of of Zionism from the freedom fighters who, you know, I, I have no qualms with what was going on in, in relation to that, but there's a fine line there, well, between these lines of separation, and until ultimately you, you get to uh, what can only be called uh, terrorist acts. A and well, at one end, you get blamed if you're the Irgun, and they didn't do them except against the British, and they should have. Um, what's going on in Washington, there isn't a fine line. They weren't there. Well... Yeah, are, are you telling me that uh, that Walter Winchell and and Drew Pearson did not mount an aggressive uh, campaign in the newspapers to uh, unseat, at least unseat, uh, Forrestal from his position? Well, I again, I think, they were journalists. They were allowed. That's part of journalism. There should be journalism like that today. Wait till you see who you're going to get leading you next election. Well, you know, we're, th this this is uh, something that I've I've written a lot about, and I, I it's it's all in the book, and I I wish we could reference what is in the book, and instead of having this uh, more general philosophical discussion without tying it into the details that are. We'll do another interview next time. Just know that what was going on in 1949 uh, in Israel was an out-and-out -out war against the right who ended up being the terrorists and against the religious who ended up losing their land and their real estate. It was a first-class mess. And, well, interview to come, we'll talk the Holocaust. And, oh, gosh. What do, you, what, what, do you, uh, what would you call, for, for example, the... Um, the attack on the, the King David Hotel. Uh, I by think that was, that was a terrific attack. It was against the British. There was plenty of forewarning, and it had nothing to do with Forest or Washington. Well, I, I agree with that, but it, um, 
but but you, you 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 just stated that there was no acts of terrorism there, but it was in in uh, it was in July of 1946 when when uh, Jewish men well, dressed think, dressed as Arabs. Uh, you're, stretching, uh, you're stretching. All right, there was a war going on. The British had to get out. Fine, that's not the same as killing the American Secretary of Defense which you say were done by a capital of Zionists, I assure you they weren't the right wing who did the King David Hotel. Well, uh, are, are you I saying know. that, are, are you saying that it was not Jewish men who, uh, who oh, did that attack and killed 91 people? I didn't say what it was. It's a separate act. All right, you have a war, and many, many, many more Jews died in this war, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go in full flight. But the fact is, it forced those not to. It wasn't by the Chayruf; they weren't involved in this stuff. Okay, let's move on then. All right, this one you got to re-research if you're sticking by that. It's based on a very, well, very... No, I, very, excuse me, I, I think that you you need to go back and read what I actually wrote. It, it, is, it does make those distinctions. There, there, okay. were, there were differences, and, and I, I'm not saying that that had anything to do with what happened in 1949 in Washington to, to James Forrestal. I, I'm just simply giving some background as to what led up to to uh, Forrestal's death. All right. I'm going, again, I've had terrible problems just getting a computer to work. I will have you back in shortly, and we'll go through these distinctions. There's one in this book that you and I have a lot in common, a uh, real lot, and that's the liberty, and uh, well, the near thinking. Now, don't get me wrong, but you quote, and this isn't, I'm quoting you, it only failed because the liberty refused to sink. That's wrong. It only failed because the Israeli Air Force dumped their bombs in the Mediterranean. I, I was in this Air Force. I met a pilot. I, I don't know if it was an interview or not, but uh, an English historian named Peter Hunnam came to Israel researching um, all kinds of stuff. He followed up my lead. He found the pilot. Apparently, he was arrested when he returned to the base. If Israel wanted to sink the Liberty, they would have sunk it. Well, there, there were four torpedoes fired that missed. Now, we don't know. that They may have missed on purpose, if, if that's what your, your point is. That, that is. that is possible. I'm not... I, I wasn't there, so I wouldn't be able to explain what, whether it was done on purpose or not. But they fired four torpedoes, all of which missed. And then there was a fifth torpedo. And now this is the point I think that you can agree with. Be, because, and I'm getting this from a, one of the survivors of, of that attack, uh, who, who stated, uh, has stated on a number of occasions. And um, his name is Larry... Well, it's uh, Richard Larry Weaver, and he stated that as a result of an investigation that he had to, to have conducted, and, uh, and, and this is kind of a long story about why he had to do that, but the point is, at, at the result of it was that, that he found that his, his investigator came back to him and, and told him that, that it was actually President Johnson who ordered his own ship, the USS, it was a submarine, the USS Amberjack, to fire that fifth torpedo, and that was the torpedo that hit the Liberty. Because it was, it was Johnson's intent to, to have that sunk. And actually, I believe, and I've argued strongly in the book, that, that it was Johnson's orders to Israel to attack the ship in the first place. And I, I think this is where some of the survivors have, have gone off track a, a little bit because they have, they have put 100% of the blame, many of them have, not all. They have placed 100% of the blame on Israel and, and uh, have criticized Israel's actions 
when I believe that it was Lyndon Johnson who had ordered Israel to do what they did and in attacking the ship uh, because he, he wanted that ship to go to the bottom of the, of the Mediterranean and take all 294 men with it so that he would use that he would use that as a pretext for entering that war on, with Israel and attacking Egypt, then known as the United Arab Republic. I don't even know if he'd use Israel. Um, look, the way I've read it is he had uh, a nuclear... Uh, incredible to me, because you're talking about a city with millions of people, but he apparently had his nukes in the air. And it's a very complicated story, but Peter Hunnam, believe me when I say this, he was not necessarily sympathetic to me. But he came out to my conclusion, the same thing. The Israelis he saw the American flag, they said, what the hell is going on here? And they didn't shoot to sink. That, that may be entirely correct. I'm not, I'm not arguing with you on that point. I, I already stated that, that I, I don't know why those four torpedoes did not hit the Liberty, but they didn't. And th those were the only ones that Israel the torpedo boats, not the airplanes, but the torpedo boats that were there uh, conducting the the attack, the second phase of the attack, after the fighter uh, jets had done the first. Uh, for some reason, none of those torpedoes hit the, hit the Liberty. Yep. And it wasn't and until after yep. that that the fifth torpedo was fired, and, and according to this information I just uh, communicated to you, it was Johnson ordering his own ship to, to do that because it was this this whole idea was Johnson's all along, in my humble opinion, and and I've stated that in two chapters of the book, it's about a hundred pages, where I've made a very compelling argument. I believe that it was Lyndon Johnson, all the, all the while that set up the attack in the first place, forcing uh, Israel basically. Diane, it was he shut it down the most of Diane throat, and he ordered uh, the Liberty attack. It's uh, a nasty story. It's just well, I agree with great. you. That I don't see there's anything that we've disagreed on on, on this at all. I, I believe that, first of all, he, he, he tried to do it through uh, Yitzhak Rabin, and that didn't work, because Rabin went to uh, David Ben-Gurion and, and, you know, got... Uh, got a furious response from, from Ben Gurion that that he should not be that they have taken this whole thing too far and, and it was it, it it was such a a traumatic uh, event for Rabin that that he basically had a near nervous breakdown. But it yep. was a, the depressive Here. type. It was not the manic type that, that Johnson experienced many on many occasions. He disappeared. He was no longer in the war. And exactly. Then Diane That's right. That's all my book. That, that he, he, he excused himself and basically set out the war. And, and it was, then it went to Moshe Diane, and, and he went ahead with that part of the attack r related to the, uh, the, the air attack. And whatever well, happened... You know, the same wavelength here. You know, over time... Peter Hoonan was first, Robert Moore was next, and I think maybe you were next, but he got to... Who was, who was next? Robert, oh, Robert Moore. Moore. Don't know. Oh, my goodness. I'll introduce you when I get a computer back, okay? But Peter Hoonan did a, um, a spot on uh, BBC um, um, documentary. I know that, and I used I used his material, both his his book and his film, ex extensively in my own in my own chapters. I used a lot of material from a lot of different people, and there's nothing that I disagree with from from um, Peter Hounan. Yeah, but Robert Moore hasn't done anything with me. The liberty you can trace back to me. I'm the one who got started. Um, I I aimed him. Um, he. I'm not sure if he, I don't know if any of us got credit for this, but the fact of the matter is, Israel was defeated, uh, well, all of Egypt, and it could knock out a, a little boat. You've got to start thinking. 
Did I lose you? No, I'm here. I, you stopped in mid-sentence. I, I, I'm waiting for you oh, to finish. No, my full sentence. Israel defeated the entire Egyptian Air Force. I think if it wanted to knock out a plane, it would have if their own pilots hadn't gotten frightened by the American flag on it. Okay, I I don't know what else to say about that, but there was an attack. The, not all the pilots refused. Some of them did, and they and they went back and they were arrested or court-martialed because they refused. They, there was them, an attack. You don't d deny that, do you? Oh, they returned to base without attacking the ship. If you want to talk about an attack on the sea, there was. <laughs> Well, we have a problem there because uh, Peter Hounen uh, has documented the air attack, uh, I think, very effectively. That there, there were there was cannon fire, there there was napalm, there there was there was all kinds of armaments used, and and the air attack is what killed the first uh, ten men because they were sunbathing on the on the top decks, and and uh, the the fighter jets appeared out of nowhere and attack them using this cannon fire and missiles to take out all the the antenna and uh, uh, transmitters so that that part of the attack was was very effective and it uh, almost destroyed the ship and it was not until after that that this torpedo was fired and again I'm saying that wasn't an Israeli torpedo that that actually took it out that was an American torpedo According to the research done by one of the survivors, I just went over that. Don't worry, my readers are can be very sympathetic to your, uh, to my listeners. I'm sorry, I can be very symp sympathetic to this book. Well, I hope um, so, be because I'm trying to straighten out this confusion that has existed for 48 years. It's been it's been that long, Barry. That that that, uh, that there's no no one. I'm the first one, by the way. It wasn't Robert Moore. It wasn't anybody else. It, now, he, Peter Hounen did raise a lot of pointed questions about what was going on with Johnson. But I have devoted two chapters to to looking at that extensively. And, and the whole point of this is that I believe that this was simply another instance where Johnson, in a, in a, a demonic-type uh, mental, well, psychotic breakdown, Went, set this whole thing up, executed it, and then when it went oh, wrong. Uh, for Phil, we have to take three minutes. And by the way, we're doing very well. And this is me without a computer. We finally got it set up, but you're doing very well. Maybe it'll get sorted out but between you first, okay? Peter Hoonan, Robert Morrow, and me. There are people who are coming to very similar conclusions on the liberty. Hope we'll be back in three. First on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. 
If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin, rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossthebordor.org. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver, Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188, toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Hello, dear listeners. This is Barry. But first of all, you get my book. I do the liberty in a book called Chaptaik V. Labor Zionism and the Holocaust. It's available at www.lulu.com. That's lulu.com. There's a search engine. Just write in Chamis, my last name, C H A M I S H. And my website, thank you, David Samarin, is barrychamish.com. Uh, and you know what? Very quickly, plug yourself, then we'll get back into the new book. Okay, well, again, my book, uh, the second book, is, was called uh, LBJ From Mastermind to the Colossus. And it's, it's a sequel to the first book, LBJ, The Mastermind of the JFK Assassination. And altogether, between the two books, I have attempted to document a number of uh, presidential treasons and, and pre-presidential treasons committed by Lyndon Johnson. And the uh, what I would like to do is is to uh, go through a few of the conclusions. I, I want to just read a couple of paragraphs with your permission. Go to it. Go to it. But one thing I do want at some point that you bring up Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, and the suiciding of James Forrest, uh, James Forrestal uh, in in your chapters. All right, I await you. Okay. Well, get, getting back to the liberty issue, but uh, this is. These are the conclusions that I have uh, reached, and I'm just going to read briefly from, from a couple of pages of the book. First of all, Israel had no discernible rational reason to attack the liberty on the fourth day of a six-day war with victory in sight. In fact, it had an abundance of reasons not to attack a military ship of its primary benefactor working in tandem with them to win the war they were engaged in. The suggestion that the attack was ordered to keep the United States unaware of Israel's plans for other attacks makes no sense, considering that the United States was its strongest supporter, despite the official claims of neutrality. To presume that Israel plotted to sink the ship so quickly that no one would find, out, find that out for the purpose of forcing the United States to join the war, even at the point that Israel had practically won it already, makes even less sense. Any suggestion that the attack was made to keep the United States from monitoring Israeli communications also ignores the fact that Elent aircraft were also monitoring all radio communications in the area. 
The second point, Lyndon Johnson had previously established a pattern of reckless use of military assets just three years before this in creating an attack on the USS Maddox in order to in insert the U.S. military machine into a war in Vietnam, which he thought he could micromanage and stretch out for several years as a way to make himself and select friends very rich. He exploited the patriotism of Americans into initially following him as he portrayed himself heroically saving Southeast Asia at a distance of 9,000 miles from the menace of communism and doing this while simultaneously ignoring the communist menace then being established in Cuba a mere 90 miles from U.S. shores. After JFK's assassination, Johnson completely broke off any further relations or entities with Cuba and ignored those initiated by Castro. Third point. It is entirely consistent with his previous actions, rational or not, to believe that having an American ship attack so that Egypt could be blamed would give him the reason he needed to insert the U.S. military machine into that war on behalf of Israel and to support it in whatever way possible. As bizarre as this scenario sounds, it makes a certain sense in the paradoxical context presented in this hypothesis that it was being micromanaged within the mind of a man then considered by several of his closest aides to be certifiably psychotic, as previously noted. And, and there, I've noted that extensively in, in the book. Uh, but we'll go I on. I think the, but the Gulf of Tonkin should not be ignored lightly. Right? He was into taking ships and get, uh, to get involved. And right. teaching American ships to get involved. Yeah, the, the notion of, of Johnson forcing Israel to attack his own ship in order to achieve this goal should not be summarily discarded absent the release of all relevant records. At this point, it makes more sense in context than any other conceivable scenario. Next point. Perhaps the reason that the liberty was tagged by Johnson as a sacrificial lamb was because of its name. As suggested by author Philip Turney, a survivor, remember the Liberty, like the Alamo or the Maine or Pearl Harbor, would be a much better battle cry to rally the troops than the name of the ship it replaced. A ship was already there. In fact, when, when, before they moved the Liberty 6,000 miles from off of the coast of Africa all the way around to uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, and that ship was called the Private Jose F. Valdez. Okay, so the uh, a battle cry of remember the Private Jose F. Val Valdez just did not have the same panache. No, another reason, another reason for not sinking the Valdez was that it had a civilian crew running the ship. The only military personnel were the technicians running the electronic systems related to its communications gathering function there was probably a distinction in Johnson's twisted mind between the two that might have been part of his choice that attacking the Liberty was clearly an act of war. Not, that was not the case with the Valdez. And it may well, have... Turning back the American ship trying to save it. Don't forget that point. It's serious. Uh, I'm sorry, what... Um, you said turning... Attacking a ship... And all points save us, SOS, it was, it was received and it was acted upon. A ship was on its way to save it from this attack and was ordered by Johnson to turn back from the rescue mission. Well, it wasn't just ships. It was, it was fighter jets that were launched from an aircraft carrier that, that were about 15 minutes away. If, if he hadn't done that, those... Those uh, fighter jets would have been on the scene to uh, to protect the Liberty from the torpedo attack that still had not happened at that point. But you're right. He he ordered those to return, and and he was quoted by an admiral who who questioned him about it. What what he, he couldn't believe that that uh, the president was ordering them not to protect their own ship, and and he said that uh, Johnson came back and said. Uh, Recall the wings. I don't care if that ship goes to the bottom of the sea and takes all the men with it. I will not embarrass an ally. And that was even further evidence that he knew all along that, that it was 
as a result of his orders to Israel to attack his own ship. And, and the men on board at that point didn't even know it was an Israeli attack. Well, I dealt with them for many years, and it was very tough for them to understand that their president was behind the attack. They really didn't want to believe that. Well, you're right. That's It's entirely correct, and I can understand, especially given the context here, that Israel was ordered by Johnson to do it. So they, they felt, you know, that they were being uh, hornswoggled into doing something they, they had no interest in doing. So that when the ship did not uh, uh, sink, and, and then they had to own up to it, and then they had to invent this uh, tale that it was a, a case of mistaken identity, well, they uh, they were a little reluctant to come up with apologies and and uh, you know uh, you know compensation for the victims and the victims' families and and the ship itself. Of course, they were reluctant. It wasn't their idea. And you know, it, now we're diving into it, and from the point of view of uh, the Israeli Air Force, their side is not is not told. They turn back. That's how I got it, and I got it from a pilot who attacked off the Gaza coast to Liberty. He said, we saw the flag, it didn't make sense, we dumped our bombs into the Mediterranean. Well, that, that may be true, they d dumped some bombs in the Mediterranean, but they didn't, they didn't not all the pilots turned it's back. So that, uh, enough attacked the ship with, with cannon fire and napalm to all practically destroy the ship and put it on fire. Killed ten ten men sunbathing on the top deck. I mean that's just a fact, and and even Israel admits that. But even even though they say it was a mistake, mistaken identity, it wasn't perfectly flawed. Okay, but the point is, it was not a success when it didn't go down. Johnson. Now, why did he want to attack Egypt? Now, let's go into this very serious aspect. Well, the, he, he did it unbelievably for s simple political reasons. He wanted, he, at this time, you have to understand the context. Here it was 1967, and, you know, the public had turned against him. Just two years, just a couple years before that, in, in uh, 64, three years, I guess, two and a half years, he won by a huge landslide. Biggest landslide in, in history up until that time, maybe still. I don't know. It was a huge landslide. Now, I think, well, never mind. It, it may have been, uh, there may have been a larger one since in 1972. But but the point is, his popularity had, had gone from very high to very low in a record period of time. And he knew that he was going to have an uphill fight trying to run for president the following year. This is 67. Well, the elections were in 68. They were scheduled for, you know, the normal elections were in 68. So he, he knew he was going to have a hard time. And he, he was constantly battered by the fact that he, all these kids across the street in uh, Lafayette Park were out there shouting every day, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? And he heard that in, his, in the Oval Office, in his in his residence, uh, bedrooms, and so forth. He heard them over there, and it just, it just irritated the hell out of him. And, and he, he thought, and I think probably correctly so, that many of those y uh, young people were Jewish. Well, we know they were. I mean, you had... Uh, they were. You, <laughs> but we well, were getting yelled. Well, Nasser was alive with Russia over the stupid Acts 1 Dam, which Eisenhower refused to, uh, to allow. It would be an ecological disaster, and he, he backed off. The Russians backed in, and Egypt was a Russian communist state. It'd be great to attack him. Oh, and yes, you're, you're, you're right. That fed into it. And, and in fact, in fact he, he was so upset with Nasser because Nasser had turned against the United States and turned towards... Uh, uh, the USSR for for their support, and that upset him also. But I'm just saying there were a number of things that had upset him, and when Johnson gets upset or got upset, and you have to understand that he he would 
he would have psychotic episodes. Now, I'm not making this up. This comes from people uh, like Arthur Schlesinger, uh, Richard Goodwin, in his book, Remembering America, quoted, both of whom, by the way, quoted Bill Moyers extensively in, in that assessment. So here's, here's three, and, and there are a few others that also uh, got, got a taste of all that. that I've, I've identified them throughout both of my books that Johnson was having a, a series of psychotic breakdowns. He was basically unfit for the office at that point in time. So he was irrational. He should not have been there. He should not have been in the Oval Office with that, in that state of mind. So, but, but what I'm getting at here was his reasons for doing it were entirely his political future. It was every, everything he did, every decision he made, had to do with what would be best for Lyndon Johnson. Okay. And expanding civil war in Vietnam in some way helped him out. Well, you, well, the war in Vietnam, and, and everybody had, or most people had figured out by then that it was, uh, you know, just ridiculous, and uh, we shouldn't have been there, and so forth. And and and, but he stuck by his guns. He 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 was still insisting that that we. We had a mission there to accomplish, and, and that we needed to be there to save all of South Southeast Asia. Well, you know that was all in his mind, and and it's time we understand exactly what that war was all about. It was about again his personal, f financial, and political future. That's all it was, and and for for him to uh, adopt this thing, well, it was a, just like another Korea, and and we had to save. You know, uh, Viet Vietnam from going communist. He wouldn't be, you know, a part of uh, another communist takeover of a of a country. Well, here we're we're trying to aid just half of Vietnam, the southern half of Vietnam, uh, and and it was run by you know uh, <laughs> despots at that time, and and they had no support, real support among their own population. So. To, to, to say that that was a, a, a case of helping the capitalists down there, you know, fight the communists from up there, it was ridiculous. It was a nationalistic kind of battle that was going on there. And Ho Chi Minh was simply trying to unite his country and, and have it continue, you know, as, a, as an independent country. And, and uh, he was actually just extending the battle against uh, the communist China. As it's out, he, the 57,000 young Americans were killed, not counting the number more, well, not morally, near morally wounded. Ho Chi Minh got his country, and the world had to go to hell. Well, I, like I said, it was, it was that was what it was about. It was a nationalist. It was a civil war. Is what it was, and we had no business Americanizing their civil war. It was it, it, when you look back at it, it it was probably, arguably, the most absurd, uh, unnecessary, and misbegotten war of all time. It, you know, and I'm sure that you could argue that there were others, but <laughs> I don't think I don't think that there anything compares quite quite to that, especially since all of the the, the most uh, extensive research by, by the people who have studied it in the last 50 years have kind of concluded the same thing, that it, it was um, th there, it was a pointless war, you know, and so for any, anybody to defend that, you know, we should have been there still is, well, ridiculous. I'm going to add uh, a personal one. Uh, when Peter Huna moved to my home, I just um, told him a rumor I've been hearing. Nasser died um, really shortly after the Liberty. He was 52 years old. Um, and there were rumors all over the place that it wasn't natural, like they said. And his eyebrows perked up, and he said, do you have proof? And I said, no. <laughs> I tell, when I don't have proof, I say so. But that's what I, I've been hearing a bit, that they took care of him. They well, in the south, and he, he, if you want to look at the whole history, uh, 
we don't. Okay, let's. I'm going to add one thing. I have so many of your notes all in front of me. I'm just going to add one last story. Johnson had this weird sense of humor, and I did this on our last show. Uh, he was accused of stealing votes, I believe, in 48, uh, a senatorial race from a woman. Apparently he lost. He, he said, I never stole the votes. I just borrowed them. I gave them back in 64. Well, I, he would say all kinds of idiotic things, so that doesn't surprise me. I, I don't know what that was all about, but he didn't borrow them. He he stole thousands of votes, and that's not just my opinion. That that actually is something that uh, Robert Caro has said in his uh, first book. There were thousands. It wasn't just those that last uh, 200 votes that that everybody points to were in the box 13 business. It was thousands of votes just to get to that point. And, and then that was the final, you know, the, the, the final uh, piece of it. But that, that was just a minor aspect. A actually, it was, it was probably one of the most outrageous and, and brazen things. When, when, when they held that up, and, and three days later, after the, the election, after the votes were counted on election day, three days later, they, someone comes up with this one and says, oh, here's another uh, a precinct ballot box that we just found. And it was practically, it was, well, it was 200 uh, votes for Johnson and one vote for the, his opponent, or whatever, the number, similar numbers. Well, he apparently had a sense of humor about his corruption. Okay. Yeah, well, um, yeah, he was a real funny guy, all right. But uh, I, I don't know. I guess I'm a little jaded, and I have studied him too much because. Um, <laughs> I think this one, this little point was on your side. Now I'm sitting here with your notes, and uh, you know what? I want to go to Martin Luther King and James Earl Ray and the suicide in the forest. So we don't have a lot of time. Uh, is there a way to get some of it out? Well, uh, how much time are we talking about? Just just a few uh, minutes? That's it. You know what? I'm just going to end it. We'll do another show. I'll give you a call. When I get my computer back, you know what? We did just, just great. Leave it at that. Now, I'm going to finish with this point then. We'll get to the other murders, but you're saying the great society legislation, which essentially was civil rights. You're saying it was done uh, to take the focus off JFK's assassination. Now, how would it do that? Well, <laughs> it, it was done uh, as a means to, uh, to, to take the focus off of that calamity that bloody calamity back in Dallas and put everybody on a different you know uh, <laughs> different issue and and he did it on JFK's back that is he he used Jeff the memory of the late departed president as a means to energize the whole population the whole you know the whole country to get behind this uh, long dormant legislation that's been sitting there for and and in fact he was he was this is the this is the critical point he was the one who who uh, tried to to stall that legislation all during the time he was the vice president and even before that when he was the so-called master of the senate he did he had no reason in other words he, he did everything in his power to to uh, stall that legislation so that it would be there on the table for him to take off the table and then push it through Congress and somehow get the whole country behind it. Because at that point, Barry, everybody knew that it was time to, 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 to move that legislation. All those churches burning down south and all the riots and the, and the, the sit-ins and so forth, you know, people were pretty sick of that. Even conservative people, Republicans were sick of it. And, and, and they all understood that it was time to move on with that. And you're saying Johnson's heart wasn't in it. 
Johnson's heart was never in it until it became important for his own legacy, you see. So in other words, he understood all, all along that once, once he had it, had it passed, well, here, here it is. It's 50 years later, and who, who, who gets all the credit for that legislation? It wasn't Kennedy who, who, who was trying to push it back in 62 and early 63. In fact, he, he was the one who had... Uh, uh, Burke Marshall draft that legislation and bypass Johnson, who was the chairman of the of the uh, Equal Opportunity Commission back then. So uh, that's just unbelievable. Here, 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 here they were trying to draft legislation, and they didn't even include Johnson in the discussions about what should be in that bill. That that's what they th they thought of Johnson. Well, just so you know, that's the one plus that has survived in his legacy that he was a civil rights president. Well, yeah, but, I mean, that's, that's the problem. You see, he, he did it for his own political reasons and his legacy, and it had nothing to do with the plight of, of uh, poor people or uh, African Americans who he used the N-word over and over and over. You can look that up on the Internet. Uh, he, there's many instances where, where he was recorded using the N-word. What? Saying me. The N-word. What's the N-word? Well, it was nigger. Oh, no, Negro. In 67, uh, nigger was very defamatory. Negro was nice. Well, Johnson used it all along, and even when he was president, he was still using it. So, excuse me, but that's that's a fact. You can look look it up. I can give you a citation if you wish. Oh no, I think we've harbored this point enough. They were different times, folks. Oh gosh, and your president was using the defamatory term, and that's a point. Oh gosh. A minor point. Oh, Phil, we'll have you back and sort of, it gets, well, it was pretty good this time around. And I've got lots more notes. My, uh, to my fine listeners, that was uh, Phil, uh, 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 Phil, Nelson, what's wrong with me? Folks, I am under tremendous stress getting this show out this week, but we're doing it. Thank you, Phil. You were terrific. We'll have you back with me. Okay, thank you. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188.